Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Eric Estevez, and I'm the executive director of the Lenny Zayton Fund. Uh, and this morning, we have a pretty interesting conversation for you all uh, about the intersection of philanthropy and cannabis. Um, as the ED of the Lenny Zakin Fund, we are a public charity. So that we that means we raise money in order to provide grants and free training and technical assistance to small grassroots nonprofits throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in particular, the Eastern part of Massachusetts. We haven't expanded all the way to the Western part of the state just yet, but you never know. Um, so today is a virtual conversation for what I hope will be an informative and enlightening conversation. Um, I'm honored by all of you who are here and have expressed interest in this topic and want to learn more about it. Uh, we are using the Zoom meeting versus the Zoom webinar so that you can see the other attendees, but you'll notice that uh, our key speakers today are all pinned, so you can view that or you can view in gallery view. Um, we have the chat open for those who have questions. Um, you can feel free to add those throughout the conversation. So what I'll start off with is just uh, start off with some clarifying points of what this, about what this conversation is about and what this conversation is not about. So this conversation is about the intersection of the cannabis industry and the nonprofit sector and the state's social equity mandates but it's not about the pitfalls or benefits of cannabis use or consumption. It's not about the merits of legalization. It's not about traffic and parking. Um, it's also not about the social equity program, which really is about addressing disparities in representation and ownership and diversifying pathways into the industry in that way. Um, and that last, that last topic is very important, but that's just not our lane for today. But we will be talking about the 29 cities, towns, and neighborhoods that are designated as areas of disproportionate impact and what that means. Um, and as I mentioned, the fund has been a leader in resourcing and supporting the nonprofit sector for more than a quarter century. So our lane is really to highlight the ways that small nonprofits can um, connect with cannabis businesses to work together for mutually beneficial purposes, uh, whether that means employee engagement, charitable giving, talent recruitment, or community relations and outreach among many other possibilities. So with that, I'll just quickly introduce our panelists um, and then I'll jump into our questions. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you can add questions in the chat throughout the conversation. And we are scheduled to wrap up at 10.30 this morning, but we'll certainly uh, budget time for um, open questions as well. Uh, so with that, we have uh, I'd like to share, we have Danielle Drummond from Ascend uh, with us. Uh, Danielle is the Vice President of Social Equity. I think I got that right. Yes. Uh, we have Narice Camargo, who is a commissioner for the Cannabis Control Commission. Uh, we have Tomas Gonzalez, who is the Chief of Staff of SEED, uh, which is based in Jamaica Plain in Boston. And then we have Ava Concepcion, who is also a commissioner for the Cannabis Control Commission. So first question is you know, fairly easy because they know themselves. Uh, so the first question is, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection to cannabis? And I will start with Ava. Thank you. So I won't mute myself again. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Ava Calendar Concepcion, and I am um, Attorney General Healy's appointee to the Cannabis Control Commission. And um, I was chosen for this role because of my um, ties to the community and for my, my background and experience in criminal legal systems. And what I often say, I'll try to be as brief, brief as possible, but when I usually talk about who I am, I say to know me is to know where I come from. Um, I was raised in Mattapan, so I'm a proud um, Mattapan native by two remarkable women, my mom, who's also from Mattapan, and my grandmother, who was a former rep, Willie Mae Allen, who came to Boston and raised her kids in Mattapan from South Carolina. So um, I'm a proud BPS graduate. I went to all Boston public schools. I talk about this a lot. A lot are closed now. Um, the Greenwood for elementary, the Rogers Middle School, where I met my now husband, and Latin Academy for high school. 
Um, I hold a degree in criminology from my beloved HBCU, Johnson C. Smith University. And after I received my undergraduate degree, I moved to DC and I worked in the office of US Majority Whip James Clyburn. Um, but when I started my career in criminal justice, it was here in Boston um, as a victim witness advocate for then um, Suffolk County District Attorney Dan Conley. And so I did that for a number of years and decided to go to law school. Um, went to New England Law for Boston, New England Law Boston for law school where I received my law degree. And um, while a student, I ran for a city council. I worked in a criminal defense firm and then I clerked for um, a while at the appellate tax court for um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. When I left law school, I, I, I talk about this a lot because it's probably the most pivotal experience I've had. Um, I became counsel to uh, Senator Brownsberger who at that time was the chair of the Judiciary Committee. And this was in 2016. And that's important because that was also my first formal introduction professionally to cannabis and cannabis law. Um, so when I was in his office, this was the beginning of legalization for adult use here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I was tasked with figuring out what sort of laws that we had on the books for people who had records <laughs> before legalization, you know, to make sure that they can come in to this industry now and to make sure that those barriers are being eliminated as well. So that was sort of the building blocks for my work um, that became the Criminal Justice Reform Act of 2018. So it, it was a huge, massive um, legislative package, but I worked personally and specifically on the elements about around collateral consequences. So around record sealing and expungement, around um, fees and fines for individuals as well. And just, you know, reducing that ceiling window from, from three years for um, misdemeanors. So from, from five to three and from 10 to seven for felonies. Um, and then just making sure that the expungement process was available for people who had um, records for cannabis specifically. You know, this is now something that's legal. So um, most recently before joining the CCC, I was the head of government affairs for Suffolk County District Attorney, Rachel Rollins, who's now our US attorney. Um, and that is where me and Danielle met. That's my homie from the Suffolk County District Attorney's office. Yeah. Yes. Um, so um, I went there and you know, one of the former commissioners reached out and said, Ava, I think you should consider becoming a commissioner. And I'm glad I did. Um, I already had my, my strong ties with the AG's office. She knew my work from being in the Senate and working on criminal justice reform and some other things that she had work in um, within the legislature. And um, what I often talk about because I'm, I'm the public safety seat. So my main objective is really to protect the well being of the public and to also make sure that the compliance standards here at the CCC are solid and abided by. And from a very rigid perspective, I hold the law and order seat. Um, I'm an attorney and I have the criminal justice background, um, but I also have a number of family members who are, you know, in law enforcement, but also who have been impacted by law enforcement. So I also highlight the fact that I'm a black woman from Mattapan and I highlight that for two reasons, because I'm a really proud product of my community, but also because I understand and I talk about this a lot, I'm going to talk about this today, um, that even though cannabis is now legal, there are many communities, mine included, that are still dealing with the aftermath of the war on drugs. And with that, I'll stop and let everyone else do their intro. So thank you, Eric, and thank you everyone else for being here. Thank you, Ava, for your whole bio. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, but it's great to, to learn more about you and for others to learn more about you and your background. Uh, so next, uh, uh, we'll hop to Danielle next. So again, the question is, tell us a little about yourself and your connection to cannabis. Absolutely. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, for inviting me into this space. Um, thank you to my other panelists. It is an honor to be here in such amazing presence. Um, as Ava mentioned, I had the pleasure of working with her at the district attorney's office um, and know of Nerese and Tomas's work in the community. So very honored to be here this morning. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all of you for coming and joining us in this conversation. So just a little bit about myself. I am also originally from Boston, um, Mattapan raised as well. Um, and you know, I'm also of Jamaican parentage. Um, I think similar to Ava, 
you know, it really matters your context and where you come from. Um, and when you do this work, it comes from a very personal and deep place uh, because you get a firsthand seat at the effects of the war on drugs, at the effects of living in under-resourced neighborhoods. Um, so that context for me is always very important. And, uh, you know, I deeply carry my roots um, as well as my community with me in all the work that I do. And so I also attended a uh, Boston Latin School for high school. And then I also went to an HBCU, Spelman College. Um, and it was no question that I was gonna return home to Boston. So many of my classmates stayed in Atlanta and I understand why, but I had to come home. Um, I have a special, uh, special love for my city and really wanted to commit myself to healing my community. Um, and that's really been the underpinning for all of the work that I've done. Um, I come from a family who is always in the community. My mother is at every single community neighborhood meeting, interacting with folks, um, advocating for the things that we need. And so I really took that ethos into what do I want to do with my life and my career? And so I've worked um, in various nonprofits as well as in the public sector. I worked for the city of Boston and most recently had worked at the district attorney's office for Rachel Rollins as her deputy chief of community engagement. And really in each of those roles, it was for me, how do I gain access to these systems that have been, we have been systemically denied access to. So how do I open up that access to my community and how do I leverage the resources, the power and the privilege within that organization to the benefit of my community? Um, and so here at my role at Ascend as Vice President of Social Equity, seeking to do that work as well in a variety of different ways. And we'll talk more about that later in the conversation. All right, thank you, Danielle. Uh, and next we'll go to Tomas. All right. Well, um, thank you um, for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here with such esteemed guests. Um, and I feel like it's appropriate that I follow next after Latin Academy, Latin school, because I went to Boston Tech. So I guess all three exam schools are represented here. Um, like our first two speakers, um, I'm a native Bostonian. Um, my family came here from Puerto Rico in 1968, and we lived in South Boston from 68 to 73 until our homes were um, firebombed. And we had to relocate many Puerto Rican families from San Lorenzo, Puerto Rico, um, into various housing developments throughout the city of Boston. My grandmother lived in the Villa. I grew up in Eggleston Square. Um, the majority lived in Franklin Field or Cathedral. Um, so we had family dispersed throughout the city of Boston um, during those times. In early 1975, um, I smelled cannabis for the first time going to first grade. Um, and the olfactory is very strong. <laughs> and so it was something that I never um, got rid of. And somewhere early in my age, um, not long thereafter, I started to consume cannabis and have always been a supporter and an advocate because I felt as a child growing up in Negleson Square um, during that time in the early 70s and during busing, you had to self-medicate. So I just leave it there. You know, a lot going on. <laughs> um, but I am um, one of the um, co-owners and co-founders of Seed. Um, prior um, to um, taking on that endeavor um, and co-locating a cannabis dispensary and a social justice um, cannabis museum um, in Jamaica Plain in the community that I grew up in. Um, I spent a lot of time in government. Um, unlike folks who left the city, I got stuck here. Um, and so I went to Boston College. Um, I did history um, and political science. Um, during that time, I did a lot of work in voter registration, voter engagement, from part of the solution, Commonwealth Coalition, Duota Latino, um, figuring out ways in which to engage um, our community um, to become active in the political process. Um, I caught the eye, I guess, of Menino. Um, some part of 2000 and 2001, um, I became Latino liaison um, in September of 20, in 2002, um, and had been in the administration um, in several capacities. Um, I went on to work at Boston University, Government and Community Affairs Department, um, the, right after the bio lab to sort of 
rebuild relationships after a very um, unfriendly community process. Um, and that's sort of been my sort of thing ever since is mm -hmm. really working in that field. Um, I was um, at one point deputy director of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services and assistant commissioner of, of inspectional services. I'm very rooted to government um, and figuring out the impact that my family experienced, ways in which we can improve that. Um, and so see it has been a, a passion project in that regard um, because it does intersect um, in many ways, um, my love and understanding of cannabis and the impact that it has had on black and brown communities. Um, and when we talk about um, our place, um, you know, we wanted to find something that was more than just the um, letter of the law. We wanted to find something that was the spirit of the law um, and really sort of embody that. And so the museum is a complete example of all of our collective histories of owners um, and the impact that the industry um, prohibition has had on people um, and now on this new industry. Um, so I'll sort of leave it there. I hope that was enough of a caption into who I am. Um, I did want to mention one other thing um, that I'm very proud of. Um, um, I'm a uh, founding member of Raise Up Massachusetts. Um, that's one of the things that I think I hold very dear. Um, and raising the minimum wage and the earned sick time and creating a millionaire's tax while trying to be a millionaire, I guess, um, <laughs> as conflicting as that is, um, is really something that my whole life has been about um, and something that I'm very proud of and hope that we continue to do in this state because it's the state's largest social justice table and one that's really making a, a big impact on a lot of ways. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Tomas, and, and for that work as well. And bringing us home, Maurice, can you tell us a little about yourself and your connection to cannabis? Absolutely. I'm going to try to do it in two minutes so we can get to our questions. <laughs> um, but first, I just want to say, uh, well, good morning. Thank you. There's a lot of folks here. I see folks from Springfield. Um, I see folks from the CCC, our staff who's on here. I see folks uh, from Florida. And I see folks from just around the around the state. I know Mr. Watkins, you just got on from the Urban League. So I just wanna say thank you um, for your interest in this topic. So I'll just go quickly. So I am, there's a lot of uh, synergy amongst all of us. I currently live in Mattapan, um, originally from Miami. Uh, I'm from a town called Hialeah, which the world is so small because Tomas has a cousin who grew up in my town and we met in high school, and then when we came up to Boston, we figured out that we knew each other and we knew Tomas, so that's how small the world is. Um, I'm a child of immigrants. Um, I was a student athlete in 1993. I came to Mount Ida College up in Newton um, on a soccer scholarship. I, I, I didn't know where I was coming. I just knew that I, I was able to play soccer and I had a scholarship um, and I, was, I just said, yeah, why not, right? Um, I've now lived in Massachusetts over 25 years. I lived in Dorchester for a while and bought a home a few years ago in Mattapan, which I love. Um, my undergraduate degree is in criminal justice. Um, my master's degree is in public administration. And a little bit about, uh, a little bit about, I guess, me and that background is that, you know, I grew up in Miami in the 80s and the 90s. Um, when we talk about the war on drugs and the failed war on drugs, um, in Miami, I saw it firsthand, um, not to get into it too much, but it was impactful. I had families that were impacted by it, I had friends who were impacted by it, uh, folks who didn't make it. Um, so I understand what this, um, what the war on drugs uh, did to our communities, but also how it impacted generations, right? So I spent uh, about 15 years um, in the criminal justice system. Um, funny enough, uh, Commissioner Concepcion and Danielle, I also worked in the Suffolk County DA's office, uh, first for Ralph Martin, and then for Dan Conley. I was a victim witness advocate, every, probably every possible unit um, in the DA's office. Uh, but I'm also the, one of the creators of the uh, Office of Community Relations at the DA's office, which still stands today. Um, I, my, a lot of my background is in managing public policy, creating programs for at-risk youth, both local and on a state level. Um, under Governor Patrick's administration, I worked at EOPS. I one of, was one of the creators of a program called the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative, which is still around today under Governor Baker, and I'm really proud of that. And it, at the time, it was for 
18 to 24 year old men who were likely to kill or be killed. It's not expanded to women and family members and so on. So one of the things I'm definitely proud of. Um, another fun fact, while I was at um, EOPS, the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, I managed the Witness Protection Board. So that was, um, that was interesting, <laughs> uh, to say the least. Before coming to the Cannabis Control Commission, I worked at AT&T, and I was in charge of regulatory affairs, both here in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island. Uh, so I was definitely um, understanding the regulatory process and what that looks like, right? It's a lot of what we do today as commissioners. Um, and I think, Danielle, like you said earlier, we've met in, in a lot of the community work that we've done. Um, I have extensive experience in nonprofit startups. Um, so uh, about 11 years ago, actually Sunday, I created an organization called Chica Project uh, to empower, uh, empower and inspire um, young Latinas and women of color to just succeed and, and, and be themselves and, and be at these tables where we're at today. So I'm really proud of that. Um, the organization is, is um, sustainable, it's doing its thing. And as a founder, I'm very, very proud. And like I said, it's been 11 years on Sunday. So I was really excited this week. Um, my role here at the commission, I am the social justice uh, commissioner. Um, it's, it's a seat that I sit in. Obviously, um, it's, it's part of my work, uh, my life's work, and it's to, you know, to really be a voice for Black and Brown communities that are not at this table. Um, my appointment is uh, via Governor Baker, A.G. Healy, and State, Rep uh, State Treasurer uh, uh, Goldberg. So it's, um, it's a five-year appointment. We've now been here about 17 months. I'm excited. I really like this job. It allows me to bring my political work. Um, I'm a political organizer. I was, um, and allows me to bring in the criminal justice experience that I have, and then my nonprofit um, leadership sector experience. So I'm excited. Thank you for being here, and thank you for the invite. All right. Well, thank you, and Nuri. So I'll continue with you with our my first question. So, um, can you elaborate a little bit more on? what the Cannabis C Control Commission is and what it actually means to be a commissioner. A little more, can you give us a little more context? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I would say um, the CCC is an independent state agency that regulates cannabis in Massachusetts. That's what we do, we're regulators. Um, in 2016, I think we all know that the voters um, voted to legalize adult use of, of cannabis. Um, we at the CCC, I'll say this, um, our, our, our job <laughs> and the mission is to honor the will of those voters by safely, equitably, and effectively implementing and administrating the laws, enabling access to medical and adult use um, marijuana in Massachusetts, right? So the commission is made up of five commissioners. There's two of us here today who serve in topic-specific seats. So you heard Commissioner Concepcion talk about her public safety seat. I talked a little bit about my social justice seat. So there's five of us. Um, we're usually, we're here for five years. Um, something you will all hear today is the impact of, um, of, our, of the Cannabis Control Commission in, in Massachusetts. But most importantly is that we were the first state in the nation to mandate full participation in the legal industry by individuals that have been harmed by marijuana prohibition, right? And we're the first to have a uh, social equity mandate, which is a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. But in a quick nutshell, we are regulators um, at a state level. We have public meetings once a month where we, behind the scenes, we, you know, we get ready. It takes us about two weeks to get ready for our public meetings. We are reviewing applications. We are reviewing policy. We're doing research um, so that when we're coming in front of these public meetings, we are able to vote on licenses. Um, and you'll hear a little bit later what's the process in terms of us also putting conditions on licenses, um, but also discussing policy topics that will impact the industry and then voting on them. Um, I can keep going on. Commissioner Concepcion, I don't know if you wanna add anything to the commission piece. No, I think that was a good breakdown. And the, the fact that you know our equity mandate, we were the first state in the entire country to have an overall equity mandate. I know there was, um, and my, 
brain is drawn a blank on, on the city. That's terrible. There was a city in California that ha also had an equity mandate. Mm -hmm. but we we're the first and we're also the first state on the Northeast. So yeah. a lot of people look to us for their guidance. <clears throat> and we, you know, we talk about this a lot. There's a lot that still needs to be done here to make sure that we're satisfying that mandate. That's all I'll add. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you to add more though. So <laughs> look to you for guidance because you mentioned equity mandates. So um, and we'll share in the chat, but there, there's such a thing as positive impact plans and diversity plans. So what, what are those things and what do they mean? What sort of, do they offer some sort of benefit to communities? Yeah, so those, we, this is a good segue because um, the positive impact plans and diversity plans are that equity mandate in action. So um, we are the entire state and the cannabis industry here by mandate is required to um, have full participation in the legal industry by individuals who've been harmed by the official words are cannabis prohibition and enforcement and to positively impact those communities. So, um, you know, there are state laws and then as regulators, we've created in our regulations a mandate as well for every potential prospective licensee, current licensee, if you want to open a business in this state, you have to submit and you have to have a plan accepted by us, by the five commissioners, uh, positive impact plans on how you will positively impact um, communities here, those communities that we've identified as being disproportionately harmed, and also submit diversity implant, impact plans. Um, for positive impact plans, that plan has to say how you were going to give back to an area that we've deemed, one of the 29 that we have now, as a community that's been most harmed by the war on drugs. The official terminology is disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition and enforcement. Um, so your plan has to either affect that, those communities or um, convicted in individuals or um, formerly convicted individuals or people who have um, family members. So. Um, uh, whether that be parents, sorry, I don't know if Norris, we were adding anything to that, but so that that's a way that communities can benefit. And what I also talk about is that, um, and I highlight this a lot, is aside from tax revenue, positive impact plans have the greatest impact on non-licensees and non-consumers because it impacts entire communities. So regardless of if you are actively engaged in cannabis work, regardless of if you have a business, want a business, want to do anything in the cannabis world, or whether you consume or not, positive impact plans are ways that entire communities are benefit and should be benefiting from the state's cannabis industry. That's now exceeded $3 billion in this state alone. So there's a lot of resources here, and there's a lot that should be going to the communities that we've identified and to those who've been most harmed by the war on drugs. But I know a part of this conversation today is just to make sure that people are aware of this mandate and the fact that this is a requirement for all licensees here. Um, and, you know, uh, an impact plan can include a, a number of different things. You know, there's monetary gains. So if someone wants to give a contribution to, you know, an organization, if someone wants to do an actual act, you know, a regular community event, what I talk about a lot, you know, because of my work in criminal justice reform is around sealing and expungement clinics and making sure that these licensees are doing something to make sure that resources and tools are being given to those people who have been impacted, who are still battling and having trouble finding employment because of the records that no longer exist because it's legal now. So that's a little breakdown. And Commissioner, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. I, I don't know if I've covered the entire breakdown of positive impact plans. I think that was good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna save some for the other questions because I'm sure that I feel like Tomas and Danielle who are out there actually creating the positive impact plans and implementing it, I think can share a lot with us. Mm -hmm. All right, well, you already asked my question because that's where I was going next. I was gonna skip my question that I had um, and go jump straight to Tomas. Um, can you share a little bit about what SEED has done? And you know, we just shared in the chat examples of real positive impact plans and diversity plans at the CCC's um, res resource web link. Uh, but can you elaborate on what your company has done um, in terms of your approach, Tomas? Absolutely. Um, I would um, just like to go on record um, that the CCC has um, some model um, positive impact plans. 
C just happens to be one of the model impact plans. I just throwing that out there. I'm kidding. Um, but um, so our process was pretty lengthy in Jamaica Plain. Um, we attended um, 10 community meetings and um, went through a lot of hoops and hurdles um, to get our place cited. But it was, they, we have kind of our own CCC. So, you know, um, community character and cannabis. Um, and we take community and character very seriously. So um, our work is deeply rooted in all the things that are JP. Um, I will point out one thing when we talk about um, areas of disproportionate impact, um, which is in the 1970s, this neighborhood would, would have been an ADI, uh, but under the current situation, it's currently not. Um, but we can get into that a little later as we get deeper into that question, if we do or not. Um, but um, one of the things that we did is we committed to a lot of nonprofits in the neighborhood. Um, so whether it was the JP Music Fest, um, whether it was the Little League, um, other um, nonprofits um, who do social equity work, um, we really worked with them, um, like Spontaneous Celebration, which is one of the longest serving um, organizations in Jamaica Plain, who puts on the Landon Fest and um, who puts on Wake Up the Earth. Um, you know, working with them and giving to them and making sure that we can work with them on a regular basis was a serious um, commitment um, from our organization. Um, there were other organizations that we couldn't work with because they received federal dollars and just were not in a position to really um, connect with us. Um, and, and an example of that is Bromley, um, Mildred Haley, um, aka Bromley, mm -hmm. when I was growing up. Um, because of the BHA and federal dollars and the things that they do. It just, you know, things like that we couldn't work out, but there were so many other groups that we were able to work with. Um, one of the events that we put on um, that I think um, benefits a large sector of the community, um, in 2020, um, when we got our provisional in, Mar in March of 2020, you know, COVID hit. Um, in 2021, when everything was starting to open up, um, um, Pride was not in the position um, to host all of their events and their parade. Um, so we endeavored to do um, their Jamaica Plain block party um, and work with a lot of community groups um, to host a block party for the neighborhood. Um, because for 25 years, um, Pride had hosted one behind our store. Um, and we just felt like the LGBT community, the Jamaica Plain community, families, you know, really deserved, you know, something outside of COVID. Um, to really get together and rally around. Um, and we had 2,000 participants. Um, this year, we worked with um, folks from Pride directly, Sam mm -hmm. Adams, the host one that hosted well over 4,000 people this year. Um, and we continue to do that kind of work um, with the neighborhood and the community to make it as, you know, as inviting um, and as community-centric as possible. Um, and one of the other things, um, the museum itself, um, when we got going and wanted to do this way back when, um, we wanted to make sure that this location was an educational center. We didn't know what exactly we wanted. Um, but since then, um, we've got it as a 501c3. Um, so the Core Cannabis Museum um, hosts events. Um, we um, had an opportunity to work with the city of Boston to do um, Cannabis 101, um, where we worked um, with a host of different people to break down a lot of the different parts of the process and really engage um, social equity and economic empowerment um, folks looking to gain more access, more information um, and a greater connection. Um, and we made that virtual and it's received thousands and thousands of hits since then. And particularly for a lot of people of color, it, which I, I think just because of Boston, there's more resources here, but like Western Mass, Central Mass, we get a lot of hits from there. Um, and just in different events here in Boston, you hear people say, oh, you guys put on that social equity for cannabis. And it's just amazing to see the kind of impact that the museum is making um, in just that way. Um, and so, you know, we really connect with groups. We really work with them and try to reach them at their needs um, and try to understand how we can improve in, in whatever way we can. Um, so whether it's the Puerto Rican Festival, which is dear to my heart, which we um, contribute to, or the Caribbean, um, festival, um, but you know, we can we try to find ways to work with people as best as we can, and things come up who aren't even connected, like JP Open Streets. I mean, uh, JP Open Studios, which is um, all of the arts 
JP is a big part community. We just engage with it. Like, you know, it's, it's not, it's important to be a partner in any way we can. Um, and that's hope, that's all we really hope to do. Thanks, Tomas. So next I want to bring Danielle back into the fold. Um, and again, you know, this conversation, we have two commissioners and then two, you know, representatives from the cannabis industry. We don't have someone from the nonprofit um, community or, you know, the general, you know, a butter community. Um, but that's, you know, this is the initial conversation. Uh, we're looking likely to have more. So just wanted to kind of frame that and just state that up front. Um, so, you know, we have a kind of a certain angle that we're coming from, but wanted to ask Danielle, if you can share a little bit about uh, in what ways your company, um, you know, works with nonprofits. Do you have a vetting process? Um, you know, uh, are the floodgates open? Are people refusing to partner with you? You know, what's, what's kind of the experience been like for you? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> and excuse me, I'm just recovering from a cold, so I'm a little froggy. Um, but, you know, Ascend Wellness is a multi-state operator. So we are operating right now in Massachusetts, New Jersey, Ohio, Michigan, and Illinois. And so I'm doing work in each one of those states. And really the work is to identify as much as possible, what are those grassroots organizations in the community who are working for the community? Um, one of my values in thinking about where we're giving away our money to is really thinking about what are those organizations that are run typically by black and brown community members, right? Oftentimes when you look at the nonprofit landscape, uh, folks are not from the community who are doing the work. Um, and so one of our values is making sure that we are tapped into those grassroots communities organizations and providing them with funding. Um, I think it's important for several reasons. One, uh, folks who are in those community understand intimately the impact that it's had. Um, and two, you know, oftentimes they are not the ones who are able to get funding because they, they don't have enough money to get a grant writer or, you know, just the resources aren't there um, for their capacity building. So our ability to make sure that we are giving in those spaces is really what has been important to me. Um, another piece of that too is thinking about where are we getting our hiring pipelines from? Are we connecting deeply in the community to make sure that we are hiring from the neighborhoods that have been disproportionately impacted? Are we making the connections with those community-based organizations who are working with returning citizens? Um, so I wanna give a shout out right now to Ryan Dominguez, who I see um, here at Mass Cultivated. We've been able to form a partnership here in Massachusetts and we've I've formed these partnerships now in several other states as well, where you have an organization run by black and brown people who are working with returning citizens to get them educated in the cannabis industry and then internships and employment. This is an opportunity for me to connect there and to say, what's the work that we can do together, right? And so we're getting internships from Ryan's program. We're going to seek to employ those individuals at the end of that program. Um, and then we're also going to be engaging in expungement clinics together. Um, just as Ava mentioned, you know, I think it's incumbent on any major operator in this space to be doing their role to make sure that folks who were not able to benefit or participate in this market get an opportunity to get those records expunged and sealed and to move forward with their life. So we will be hosting several expungement clinics throughout the year, uh, the first of which uh, is at the end of July mm -hmm. at Roxbury Community College, right? Making sure that it is somewhere central in the communities uh, so folks have access. Our store location is in downtown Boston. Um, and so we've been able to do, of course, some community engagement with just the local neighborhood associations who are there making sure that we're good neighbors in those spaces, um, but looking to expand that now, right? I've been with Ascend for uh, the last six months. So it's been a lot of making sure that we're making the right connections. I'm building off of work uh, that was prior started by Andrea Cabral, who was our CEO from Massachusetts. Um, and so prior to my role being established, Andrea was starting to make those connections. And so now I can continue to look at, you know, what are the relationships with community organizations in Dorchester or relationships with relationships with Roxburgh and, and Mattapan. Yeah. Uh, Mary? Yeah, Danielle, thank you for all that. And I think it's important um, Tomas, you talked a lot about, um, you know, the, the, the local stuff, the organizations within your, within your space. Danielle, you talked a little bit about the, the work that you guys are doing. Um, I'm, I'm going to put on sort of my nonprofit scrappy founder hat. 
Um, and I just want to, Ryan, I know you came on screen, which is great to see you. Um, I know that you're doing a lot of work with the cannabis industry, but I also want to um, shout out Kwame Harris um, from Turner Falls. I don't know if people know where Turner Falls is here, but it is I do. way out there in Massachusetts. Um, and I, we read about 200 applications a month, right? Um, and we read positive impact plans. We read diversity plans. We read renewals, right? What are folks doing or what have they done a year later, right? So every time you're going to read, it takes, a, you got to renew, renew your license every year. Um, and within your package, folks will tell us, hey, uh, we said we were going to do this, but we actually did this because of COVID, right? Which is okay. We, you know, we just want to make sure that folks are, are, are doing things for these disproportionately impacted communities. But Kwame Harris from Turner Falls um, and Kwame, I, I think I don't remember the organization that you're with. Oh, you're on mute. We're gonna unmute you in a second, but I'll just say this. Um, I read in an application <laughs> that a cannabis company was working with this organization in Turner Falls. I was very curious about, how, you know, how did they connect to them in Turner Falls? Who is this young man who's running this organization? What's his background, right? So I, I connected with him, I invited him today because I think what we're seeing a lot is that a lot of nonprofits don't know how to connect with the cannabis industry. Um, the cannabis industry doesn't know how to connect with nonprofits. Um, and Commission of Concepcion, you said it earlier, right? There's, um, there's monetary gifts, there's hiring, there's all kinds of stuff, but there's also, there's also mentoring, right? There's also coaching. There's also, hey, let me bring some of my staff members to Kwame's organization and we can paint the backyard, right? Or we can plant trees together. So there's so much stuff that folks can do. And I think we're, you know, we, we again, I'm super scrappy, um, but, you know, thinking about the low hanging fruit, there's so much talent at these, um, in these companies, right? There's scientists, there's salespeople, there's marketing folks. Um, I mean, there's just a, a wealth of folks in these businesses. So I think for nonprofits, you got to think about how do we partner effectively? And as a small nonprofit, I know it's very hard. Sometimes there's, there's no capacity. So, you know, I, I just say to folks, figure out who your partners are and then how to really have effective partnership. Kwame, Kwame Harris, can I bring you in quickly to the fold? Tell us your, your organization out in Turner Falls. Yeah, I can, hear, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, thank, thanks. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner. I, um, so again, yeah, Kwame and Harris, um, the organization is called Breakout Community Resource Center. And we're, we're a very small nonprofit, about $300,000 in revenue or revenue each year. Um, and uh, we primarily work with youth and we primarily work with uh, parent, with families, right? And so we are the catch it, I have to call it, we're the catch all uh, organization. Um, and folks are needing, you know, <clears throat> you know uh, things, uh, pampers, folks are needing food, if folks are needing, um, you know, job help, if folks are needing whatever, right? That's what we do, right? It's all about empowering our community, um, and especially with people with, and engaging people with lived experience, bring about change in, uh, in the community and just being an advocate for the folks that, that need us the most. Um, and, and so- And, with, and Kwame, so, sorry to interrupt you because I'm looking at the time, but you are, not to say who, but you are partnered with a cannabis in, uh, licensee right now doing work, right? Exactly right. Um, yes, exactly right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Drop your link in the. Um... <laughs> I already did. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, feel free to add your email address. I, yeah. I will. And actually, Kwame, we, we should talk because it sounds like you likely eligible for a Zaken fund. So um, either myself or Dominique will send our email to you so you can connect with us as well. All yeah. right. Sure that. And, We're talking. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, organizations like yours, but also folks like you who are, you know, running organizations throughout the state, uh, we need we need to make sure that we're reaching out and that you guys can connect, right? Because there's, there's, you know, and I know that there's folks here from Springfield too, but um, sometimes we stay too Boston centric. So I want to make sure we're, we don't forget about Western Mass and the other places. So Eric, Definitely. back to you. Definitely. Thank you. Um, so also I wanted to bring up, so I, I hinted at it, but no one really kind of addressed it. So I know we have at least one legal uh, perspective here, but some of the things are a little touchy, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ava and I have a shared South Carolina connection and some of the black folks in our families are likely a little more conservative. And 
some of them smoked a lot of weed back in the day and some of them was not trying to smoke a lot of weed. Uh, but that's not necessarily what we're talking about. But their views about cannabis means <laughs> they likely can be a little more traditional. So some people have expressed that they have no interest in accepting donations, charitable monetary donations or employee engagement assistance and volunteers from cannabis companies. So how 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 can nonprofits navigate those kind of varying perspectives, Ava? No pressure. No, no. I I feel like um I'll give this little story. When my family found out that I was, you know, being appointed to be a commissioner for the Cannabis Control Commission, even though we're regulators, right? I'm not, you know, actively, I'm not working in an establishment. They, I, I got calls from all across the country. My family's really large, they're everywhere. And it was just like, Ava, what are you doing? So it's like the stigma is so real. And again, I do have a, tons of family as well who are, are proud consumers. Some are more proud than, than others, but it's definitely that that tension and the stigma still exists. I think we all know that here. Um, and you know what, it is a delicate line. So I, you know, I'll offer first my, my legal you know, opinion on it. Um, officially, the Cannabis Control Commission and we as commissioners, we, we can't advise on federal law. Um, but the reality is that there's really no precedent um, from the federal government. Mm -hmm. So we, we know that, you know, it's not legal federally, but there are tons of states and more states coming on every day that are have that have legal cannabis now. And we also are aware that the federal government has allowed this um, on the same kind of token and the same sort of energy, it seems to be applying right now for um, nonprofits and for organizations that do accept funds. So um, there, there really has been no sort of enforcement. So there's no president, president, there's no legal enforcement action where an org organization has accepted donations and the federal government has taken any sort of enforcement action against them for doing it. Um, with that said, with our guidance um, on positive impact plans, because that's where you see the donations being given to the organizations that will accept it, we make a really um, we make a point of noting that if you intend to take to make any sort of monetary donations um, to nonprofits or charities, you have to first obtain written correspondence or written letter certifying that that the nonprofit in mind that is intended to receive the donation or charity will accept that donation prior to it being included in your plan. So we won't accept the plan unless we know that it will be accepted by that organization. And organizations have full discretion whether or not they will accept it or not. Um, but for those that do, it's important. And again, that's why we're here to connect them um, and so that they're aware that these opportunities exist and that there are companies who are seeking to make donations and to give resources and connect with um, nonprofits and charities. So in a nutshell, you know, it's happening. Mm -hmm. We have tons of organizations right now in the state alone that are, are accepting donations. There are national organizations. I'll speak, you know, I'll use the United Way as an example the national office is accepting donations as well. And other people in other states are following suit because we all know that, you know, it seems like there's an increased likelihood that we will see federal legalization. And some people see this as an opportunity to get by, get ahead of the, of the curve before, mm -hmm. you know, you sort of miss that window of opportunity. And the same way we talk about sat saturation from a licensee's perspective, there's still that idea that you know the, the early bird gets the worm so if charities and organizations are at the forefront now and they're making it known that they accept it you are um you sort of have that 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 energy you sort of have that um awareness you're building that awareness for people who want to give um both monetarily and also you know resources and other services as well and i, I understand i think that the statute is like 280 e, 280e so like companies can't benefit from uh, tax deductible donations. Um, right. So that's kind of where it has been regulated um, in that they can't you know, claim you know, exemptions for that, uh, but it certainly hasn't been any kind of official law in place preventing nonprofits from accepting the donations. That's right. So 280E is around, you know, the, the deductions that people are allotted under, you know, federal tax law. So it's, that's a really complicated issue as well, like specifically for the companies here. That's, that's a crucial part that is, 
it takes a lot of, of money to operate. I know, you know, Tomas can probably speak to this too because he's operating, so he probably feels that. Um, but also for those who are 501c3 certified, you know, a lot of the fears that I've heard is about having that certification, you know, sort of taken away or revoked. And that just hasn't happened. So not to say that it, it won't, you know, I'm an attorney, so I won't say like it, it will never happen. I cannot say that, but that's another fear that I've heard as well. I think, Eric, you know, this is a good start to a conversation, right? I think that the Lenny Zakem Fund is a, a good place um, to start this conversation. And, and I've had so many conversations with nonprofit leaders um, in terms of educating them. And, you know, folks will go to the board, folks will talk to their lawyers, you know, they'll talk to their membership. But I think it's, you know, it would be interesting to continue the conversation. I know you guys do so many workshops around educating our nonprofits. So I think that this is a really good start to being able to educate folks, but also the industry. Because I said earlier, sometimes the industry, you know, a lot of these folks come from other states, right? And they open in Massachusetts um, and a lot of them are local. Um, but even at that, there's folks from Boston who are opening up in Turner Falls. They don't know anybody in Turner Falls, right? They have to be able to connect with, with someone or let's say in Holyoke or Springfield or Fall River or New Bedford or Brockton. So, you know, there's there's still a disconnect, right? Um, so I think that this is really, this is good. We just got to do more, more education and more awareness. I think the one thing that I, I want to end on, at least for, for this question, Eric, you brought up the stigma and I use a personal example as an individual, but the stigma is also impacting you know, the organizations who are denying because that does happen and they do not want to be seen or perceived as encouraging cannabis usage or anything, you know, that has anything to do with this industry. So that is still, it's still something. We're still working and talking about this because the reality is this is the norm now. It's growing, it's producing, it's continuing to grow. And like, you know, Commissioner Camargo referenced earlier, we review hundreds of applications every month. So people are coming through this system. And it's important that, you know, we start to talk about this more in rooms like this and other rooms as well. But that stigma is what's stopping and preventing people from accepting those donations that could be, you know, pivotal, you know, could, could really benefit entire communities as well. So those that do, like that, that's amazing. Um, and those that do not, there's a lot of the stigma that remains and that's preventing a lot as well. Yeah. And, and, and Commissioner, I, I'll just say really quickly, I know um, Eric just asked folks to add questions to the chat, but Commissioner Concepcion, to your point, when we look at this industry, it is a billion dollar industry that is booming. And we talked about the, in this state, multi billion, mm -hmm. multi billion in this state. And we talked earlier about where we come from, who we serve, why we do this work, right? And we go back and think about this, you know, what, who, and what were the communities that were mostly impacted by the failed war on drugs? This is this is an this is a benefit to these communities and these people, right? Uh, folks who've been incarcerated, their children, their families, right? The generation of poverty that this stuff has caused, right? There's so much to it. So I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's important that our communities know that this benefit is there and it is a equity mandate per Massachusetts, right? Again, one of the great things that Massachusetts has done. So I wanna make sure we stay on that focus too, so. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, going to uh, Danielle and Tomas again, um, you both kind of hinted at other types of ways that you're supporting nonprofits and communities. Um, uh, so one was about kind of um, hiring and, and job placement. So, you know, men, some of the nonprofits who may be here have an interest in possibly connecting in terms of monetary donations or employee engagement, but some of them have kind of member network or a client base or a community that they serve and support that may be interested in, in you know, really connecting and doing outreach um, to help you know, for employment opportunities or job training, workforce training. So in what ways are you doing any of that type of um, other non-monetary um, supports as well? I'll start with, uh, Tomas looked like you wanted to jump in and then- Oh yeah, I mean, I, cause you we touched on positive impact plans and maybe then get it. you asked the question about diversity plans. Um, so, you know, one of the things um, that we're required to is to hire people from areas of disproportionate impact, those are, as defined by the CCC, um, you know, in Jamaica Plain, we, you know, at least in Seed, we were fortunate enough to connect with um, the JP Neighborhood Development Corporation, um, and we worked with their office. Um, we fly um, Mildred Haley, Academy Homes, 
all of the housing developments, the entire community. Um, we put it into the Gazette, all the local papers for the hiring. We connected with the Mayor's Office of Returning Citizens, the Mayor's Office of Public Safety. We connected with the Greater Boston Legal Services. And, you know, we did like um, um, a job fair uh, presentation so people understood not only about seed, but about the industry and about how to look for expungement um, and, you know, how to connect with folks that are already doing that work. Um, and we did three rounds of that um, in JP. That's something, I, again, I'm an organizer. I'm always going to look at it as an organizer. Um, everything's a campaign. We have to be successful and win these campaigns. And if our goal is to hire people of color um, and those that have been impacted, we have to go where they're at. Um, and we have to work with as many people as we possibly can um, to do that. So, you know, those are the kinds of sort of, you know, that's in our diversity plan. That's in our positive impact plan. That's something we said we were going to do. And that's something that we absolutely did. Um, and it's something that we'll continue to do. Um, and so, you know, those are the sort of non-monetary things that we connect with and, you know, figure out how we can get those employed um, who have been impacted directly. All right, Danielle, and then um, after that, we'll go to the question that I see in the chat. Absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, similar to Tomas, you know, having worked at the DA's office and having funded so many community-based organizations that were working on employing citizens of either returning citizens or folks from the neighborhood who have been disproportionately impacted, we're now looking to reestablish those relationships here at Ascend. So that way, that's a new pipeline for us to be able to make sure that we're having that consistent flow. Mass Cultivated, as I mentioned before, is one of our partners who we're working with, but really continuing, as you know, Eric, I've connected you as well, even just the individuals I know in the community who are connectors within um, and getting folks uh, employed, making sure that our HR partners are connected to them as well. Um, so that's a part of the work. But then outside of that, uh, Nerese, you mentioned technical assistance and the resources. Yes, like Ascend has brain power, right? They are some of the smartest people that I have had the pleasure of working with from a variety of different industries. So we've started using that brain power to the benefit of social equity applicants. So folks who are applying for a license, we've helped them go through that process in Connecticut. We have uh, opened up our HR VP, our compliance VP, our president, our everyone in every department right now is open to providing technical assistance to anyone who might need it. Um, walking them through, giving them templates for you know things that they might not have any sense of how to create, right? How do you create some of these documents? Um, so that is work that we're beginning right now. Um, and we're starting off, you know, we've started off individually with folks, but really wanting to broaden that um, and thinking about who we can partner with around on economic councils, right, uh, to think about making it a bigger, um, a bigger endeavor incubation, right, where we can have five to 10 people who are coming through. We have worked with the Green Flower Media, uh, which is one of only two organizations nationally who provide accreditation or any kind of um, certification in cannabis. We've worked with them to develop an online business module that helps people not just understand how to apply, but understand how to create a thriving business model. So that is gonna be opened up um, over the summer to social equity applicants to be able to utilize for free so they can go through that business module and you know we will support that with mentorship internally from the folks in our different departments so I think using that brain that brain power to make sure that you know what we know about business we can share um, and then also lastly on that piece is also just community engagement and volunteering so as I mentioned before our retail teams are connected with some of the neighborhood organizations um, they've already done volunteer work um, with several organizations and they're always looking to do more so if you need a, a, a fence painted, if you need folks to come by and do some volunteer work, we are looking to make those connections um, and to be a support in that way and in any way that we can. Also doing food drives or other donations, um, you know, our, our team is really interested in making that happen. So anybody who is interested in connecting with us along those lines, please feel free. All right. Well, thank you, Danielle. So in the chat, we did have a question. Uh, and I'll read it. Can you share more about nonprofits navigating other donors' feelings on cannabis? For example, more conservative donors that they that do not want to see a nonprofit they support receiving cannabis. Um, you know, and then also, do you think family foundations and other funders are starting to come around? 
So I can jump in here. I mean, I do think that, you know, for the most part, I haven't received a lot of pushback when I've reached out to folks. Um, I think in, you know, all of the organizations that I've reached out to, there may have been one, um, you know, who said they're not ready at this time to accept cannabis dollars. And I think, you know, internally, that's something that organizations are gonna have to wrestle with and kind of talk through um, and figure out, you know, what are your values and what are the things that you're, you're willing to accept? I think something that can help that is education. So maybe it's a matter of bringing in a cannabis uh, operator to talk a little bit about cannabis, just to give some quick highlights on Cannabis 101, the use of the plan and why this industry exists, right? Which is primarily for healing for people. So I think if people understood really the nature of what the cannabis industry is and and let go of some of that stigma that would help. So education for those board members um, and conversation internally to come to understand that there are billions of dollars out there that you can partake in, right? Let's get to some bottom lines on why or why not we're gonna do that. I wanna co-sign and, and jump on that, Danielle. Absolutely. I, I've noticed in my own conversations now, just in my role as a commissioner, there's a lot of, there's a lot of education that still needs to happen. There's still a ton of misinformation and misconception around the industry. And you know, it's it's valid because so many lives have been harmed and impacted in such a negative way. And here in Massachusetts, you know, we talk about this because it's, you know, it, it, there's a, a large presence, but it's only been five years, at least in the adult use space, of having this legal industry. So it's really, really new. And there are still, you know, I'm gonna talk from my own, you know, I'm I'm from Mattapan. Um, you know, I, I, I have my church in Mattapan as well, and they have actively pushed against establishments, you know, breaking ground and opening in the area because of the negative connotation that's associated with cannabis. But when you take that criminality component away and you talk about, you know, the actual, you know, the, the plant itself, what it does on the medical side of things, that's one conversation, that's one component. But then when we talk about here in Massachusetts, the way that we are trying to rectify, I know this is probably completely impossible, but we are trying to rectify the harms that have lasted and continue to last from the war on drugs. I think that it's a matter of letting un donors understand and know that these donations are to help these very communities that have been so impacted and so harmed. So it's not about, you know, a crime anymore. It's like that those days are done. And I think people still need to get their heads around that. Now it's about how do we give back and how are we as a, as a group? And I've had this conversation with um, a charitable organization as well who had donors that were hesitant about you know, accepting any sort of donations because they came with that mindset. The mindset of this being, you know, we're promoting usage, we're promoting a crime, we're promoting this and that if we accept the donations, instead of saying what we're doing is rectifying harms and giving back to communities that are still trying to get back on their feet. Thank you for that, Ava. Um, so I wanted to tag in Ryan Dominguez from uh, Cult Mass Cultivated, um, just to share his thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Eric. And I just want to share a little bit of my thoughts as a nonprofit organization that does kind of run into this same problem when you go to, you know, some older uh, organizations that still have that stigma. And I think education is always the first step, uh, but sometimes that's not always enough. Uh, and I work with community colleges specifically uh, to run a cannabis education program as well. And some of those uh, community colleges accept federal dollars and also, you know, there's some older people on their foundations. Uh, that really don't want to accept any kind of money from cannabis, alcohol, tobacco, and those types of industries. Uh, so what we found was kind of a workaround of trying to have the cannabis organizations uh, or cannabis companies donate to our organization, and then for us to be able to pay, uh, you know, for all of the services of setting up a cannabis class at a community college. And I think that is one way that us as resource magnets can kind of work around some of those kind of, um, I guess, uh, perceptions about cannabis money, if it's going through you as a nonprofit organization and then partnering with other nonprofits or with other organizations to then set up uh, either the programs that are trying to have the impact that they're trying to have, or if it's cannabis specifically focused, I think they feel a little bit more comfortable when it's coming from a nonprofit organization. Well, thank you for that, Ryan. Um, I actually know that some 
uh, companies also have started their own 501c3s and or foundations. Um, so, I mean, Danielle, I know, I believe that that's what you're working on. I don't know the status of it, um, but it, you yes. know, and what's we the are progress on that? Is it still underway or has it happened yet? It has happened. So we are uh, officially established. Um, as our 501c3. And so now we're just working on getting our wording out for our pillars so that we folks can start to apply for grants. We're cer certainly still, we've given out donations through the foundation, but we want to be able to, you know, set up a grant platform so that folks can apply on a consistent basis. And so that will be coming soon. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Um, I saw Aaron, Aaron that, was, that was the question we asked already. Um, so what other questions do folks have? And also I do have a, a final question that I had. So in the meantime, a uh, question for you all was, why do you do this work? So some of you kind of hinted at it in your introduction of who you, when, we, when I asked you to share a little bit about yourself, but you know, why do you do this work? And uh, Tomas, I'm gonna start with you. Oh, absolutely. Um, Again, we have a very radical concept having um, a museum and a dispensary. Um, I do this work um, primarily to impact our community. Um, the word seed is not a noun, it's, it's a verb. Um, so unlike um, other companies um, who have more affiliates with Wall Street and big money, like we raised all our money locally um, within half a mile, a mile of our dispensary. Um, families that I've known, you know, 40, 50 years in this city. Um, and our goal was to seed, you know, not only seed knowledge, not only deal with the issue of stigma, but to seed communities, um, to help people, um, to help generational worth among black and brown people, um, to, you know, break down all of the things that obstruct um, us from really moving forward in this industry. So, you know, um, I think, the whole purpose behind doing this is, you know, one, you obviously want to own a, a cannabis company and make an impact. But if you really want to do this, you're really trying to break down the stigma. You're really trying to improve communities, improve lives, um, employ people that have been impacted, um, whether it's a family member, a cousin, or someone from Western Mass or some other neighborhood, um, like in the Valley in Worcester, for example, who's you know, gone through a lot. Um, to be able to provide opportunities that way and something that is close to them um, and close to you is an awesome feeling. Um, to be able to do this at a high level um, with such purpose and passion um, has been amazing in these last five years. Um, and I mean, I do this because I love cannabis. I love my community. Um, and I want to make sure that Black and brown people benefit from this directly and people I know. Um, I have to give it away to folks I've never met in my life, but folks that I've seen do real good um, who could have benefited from this and have and, and will. And so, yeah, that's why we do this. Um, Thank you. Uh, who'd like to go next? And we do have another question in the chat. I'll, I'll go next. I, um, it's funny, I, I, my, my plan, you know, I didn't go to law school to be a commissioner because we didn't, <laughs> Back then, you, there was no commission. You know, we didn't know that we would be legalized here in Massachusetts. Like we, there was nothing here. So I didn't, I didn't like go to law school, say I'm gonna be an attorney, I'll go this way. Um, when I was approached about the Cannabis Control Commission, I was um, actually going into the private sector. I worked in government for basically my entire career and I was getting ready to transition. I was, you know, going into be a VP um, position at a private um, firm. And um, I think the reality is it's sort of, you know, the same as what Tomas said, um, it's purpose. You don't, you don't do this without feeling, you know, like this is above yourself. Mm -hmm. This is above me. So I, I see this as an opportunity to use my skills, my knowledge and my connections as well to advance um, the industry here in a way that benefits communities that are still hit my community included. So every day that I wake up and every day that I work as a regulator, I have that in front of mind and in every conversation that I have. 
Um, and, you know, there are a lot of tired, tired days and nights and a lot of work that goes into this job. But what keeps me going is knowing what it's for and that it's not about me. So um, I think that's that's completely my, my motivator. I see this as being the place where I'm supposed to be and where I could be the most effective. And when I stop being effective, then I have to start thinking about different things. But for the mm -hmm. most part, I, I just... I, you know, it's going to sound very cheesy, but I, I feel it as like a calling. It's like I, I know I have, you know, the skills and the knowledge to make sure that this industry does what it needs to do. And I, you know, as Commissioner Camargo mentioned, we have five year appointments. So I know that I have this window for at least five years where I can like do as much as I can to, to make sure that we are holding ourselves accountable and that we're following the mandate that we have by law. Um, um, so the question that was asked in the chat is actually one that I had earlier, uh, but I'll just read what Maggie wrote. Can you share more about the best ways nonprofits can reach out to local companies to, to request a collaboration? How do you get on the radar? Yes. So um, I'll give you guys some, I just wrote down some examples. Again, this is I know I'm a commissioner, but I'm also coming from just a practical <laughs> leader in the community and someone who's um, ran a nonprofit before, but um, LinkedIn. So if you're not on LinkedIn, I don't know, I, I, cannabis companies and practitioners and folks, they have infiltrated LinkedIn, they're everywhere. Put in cannabis company, they're in there. Go to my profile, everyone on cannabis right now is either my friend or asking to, you know, or, or partnering or something on my LinkedIn, right? Um, and I think for all of us, um, the Lenny Zakem Fund. So this right here today is a huge, it, it is a, it's a big deal. It's a big conversation. I think for folks that um, are here today, one, we have to spread the word, send them back to Lenny Zakem, but also be able to, um, I know that this is being recorded. So being able to share this, um, our tracker. So I put in on the chat, um, our tracker, there's over 400 businesses that have commenced operation. Labs, cultivation sites, dispensaries, delivery. Um, we don't have research licenses yet, you know, but there's over 400 businesses in Massachusetts that are open um, and they're, in our, they're on our tracker. So if you go on our website, it is all there. Um, I would say if you're, um, if you're if you have time, we have meetings once a month. Uh, they're public meetings right now, they're on Teams, um, but you can hear us discuss some of the companies. Uh, you, can hear you can hear us talking about conditions that we place on companies around their positive impact plan and diversity plans, and also think about where you're at. So where are you located? Are you located in one of these 29 cities or towns? If you're in Fall River, okay, let me look up these companies that are in Fall River. If you're in New Bedford, you know, um, you may be in, actually in, in Newton, there's companies too, right? So, you know, there's companies everywhere, but think about where you're sitting, where your organization's at, who do you serve? Um, and then, you know, some of these companies too, what I'm sort of realizing just from reading is that some of them are, are looking to partner on veteran affairs. Some of them are looking to partner on, you know, families. Um, you know, SEED has the social justice, you, you know, museum. So think about where are you, what's your mission? Um, and then, and then do some, you know, do some outreach. This is a hustle. This is like, you had to have some grit, some grind and some hustle. Um, and you can't be afraid. The more people say no, the better. Keep, keep, keep going <laughs> to, par to partner with these folks. I'll add just, sorry, I'm in the city, so there's a lot happening outside, guys. I'll wait till that passes. Uh, just to add, if, you know, our, our meetings can be lengthy. So if you can watch the meeting, definitely do that. But we always have an agenda every month before that public meeting, you know, the week before that states every person, every organization that's coming before the Cannabis Control Commission. And what I would do, you know, I'm giving a suggestion. I'm the commissioner, so I don't know, you know, I know some of the team is here too. I'll try to stay in my perimeters. Is that, you know, that gives a list of those perspective and current licensees that we all know they all are required to do these positive impact plans, these diversity plans. That gives you a running list of people who are donating donating or should be donating, who should be doing something. Um, so it's up to you all what you use with that information, but that information is up there on a monthly basis. 
Um, so that that's the one note I would add as well. And I'll, I'll also just, and, and Eric, I know you posted it before, you know, we have a sample, well, not sample, they're real positive impact plan and diversity plans. It's public information. Go in there and read them. Um, you know, look who they've partnered up with before. Um, not to put Danielle or Domas or Ryan or, or Kwame on, 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 on blast here, but you all are partnering with people in the industry. So if people that are watching this, you know, reach out to Domas, reach out to Danielle, reach out to Ryan, reach out to uh, Kwame um, about how, how to network. Um, and I know that um, Ryan, you put in the chat to everybody that you're happy to put folks in touch with your network of dispensaries and companies that you're working with um, in your network. So thank you for doing that. Awesome. And I just mm -hmm. want to double down on that last, uh, on Nerys, some of Nerys's points, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. So many folks reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, I put my email address in the chat, reach out to me directly, um, but definitely please reach out. And when you're looking at other companies, some of them have other vice presidents of social equity or you know, folks who are working in DEI. If they don't have anyone, reach out to the HR department, right? Or the marketing department. Those are usually the two departments who, if you don't have social equity, those at least departments will be looking at partnerships. So look at those departments, reach out to those folks because they are looking to partner. And as you know, we've talked about, there is a mandate to do that work. So please reach out. So that last question was, why do you do this work? So two of you are still uh, have yet to answer it. I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, so I, you know, I think as you know, both Ava and Tomas has mentioned, this is a labor of love, right? This is a labor of love for our community that we've grown up in, that we've lived in, that we've seen the effects in, that we've lost friends in, um, you know, both to incarceration and to violence. Um, so this is deeply personal. And I feel in a lot of ways, this is often like, um, you know, your survivor's work, right? When you make it out of these situations, it is a duty for you to make sure that um, you pour back into those neighborhoods um, and that you don't let other people in your neighborhood be victimized. Um, and so for me, it has been, as I mentioned before, how do I insert myself, right? I said to myself, I was gonna come out of nonprofit. I was gonna come out of government. I was gonna come out of corporate. I, I became a Reiki certified. I was just gonna do healing work in the community and just work with my folks. That was the plan, guys. That was the real plan. And I was gonna do that. And I found myself drawn back into system with Rachel, right? Because I'm like, here's a black woman, the first black woman DA. I've gotta be behind her to support it because I know how difficult the work is internally. Um, and then from there, now I'm dragged into cannabis because I'm like, like, here's another opportunity to get in on the front end and to make sure that, you know, the community is getting, you know, a piece of this multi-billion dollar industry. And so for me now, once again, it's back in the fold. Every time I try to get out, they pull me back in, <laughs> right? Um, but this is the work um, because as Ava said, it's not about you. It's about your community and about how do you utilize your talents and the resources that your community poured into you to then give back to it. Thank you, Danielle. And who's the last person? Why do you do this work? Absolutely. Well, I'm just going to say that thank you for those who just hit me up on LinkedIn. I just got some requests on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> right good, on it. Good, good way to um, implement. Um, listen, I think the best part about going last is that I think everything that you know the panelists have shared, you know, ditto. Um, I'm not new to this work. I've been doing this work um, since third grade, right? I've been organizing. I, I was in Youth Crime Watch at Miami-Dade County in my elementary school. Um, and when I first got out of college, I ran a program. Some folks may be too young for this, but I was part of um, uh, McGruff and Take a Bite Out of Crime, right? Um, that was one of my first jobs um, in Miami and in, 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 in working with... Um, with juveniles um, in the school system out there in terms of folks that you know were at risk so this has been this has been my life work um not only just the work that i've done as an adult but also as a young person um growing up in miami like i said in the 80s and 90s not to get too you know too into it but you know i've i've lived it i've seen it my family has um my my family has i'm just gonna say that uh, for now, but um, it's personal to me. And I think as someone who came to Massachusetts, um, I'm Colombian, I'm Dominican, I'm Boricua, um, I speak Spanish. And for someone that comes from a disproportionately impacted area, 
who is able to be at the table now to create small policy, you know, smart policy, implement and be a regulator, it's a big deal, right? I, this is an honor, it's a privilege. Um, and you all know this, this let's, not, let's, not, let's not, you know, beat around the bush here. These jobs are not easy to come about, right? The work that we've done all of us together um, allows us to be at this table. And for me, when I look at this industry and I look at the culture of cannabis, and I look at the plant and the, you know, the, the healing aspect of it also, it, it, it means a lot. And when then I look at the money and the funding and the policies and stuff that is still sitting at the state house right now, um, this is why I do this work. Um, and if we can work, to get, work together, be collaborative um, at the commission and at the community level to be able to provide access and opportunities for folks, um, I'm all in. So you know, Commissioner Concepcion said it earlier, like this is a lot of work, um, but we're very privileged to be in these seats. And, you know, as, as, a, as a woman of color, this is a, a big deal for me. I know that Ava and I, I think we're, you know, we're the, probably the, Ava's the first, you know, African-American commissioner on our commission at a state level. Um, and I'm our first Latina commissioner on a state level, right? And to get here has not been easy for all of us. So you know, we're, we're in it um, and we just want to be able to be helpful um, to folks. So thank you for allowing us to be here today and for this time. And again, I'd like to just thank all of you. So Danielle, Tomas, Maurice, and Ava, thank you for your roles that you're playing in this space as, as we are diversifying it on all angles from the ownership side um, to the, who, the, the types of nonprofits and communities um, being supported by it. Um, to who's working and running these businesses as well and supplying them as well. Um, but thank you also for your advocacy uh, in this space and uh, representing, um, especially for the small nonprofit community that we represent at the Zakem Fund. Um, so just wanna thank you all again. Uh, thank you everyone who attended. Um, we're gonna wrap up questions, um, but we've included a lot of links in the chat this clearly was a recorded session, so uh, it will be uploaded uh, to our YouTube channel probably within the day um, so that folks who weren't able to attend can still catch the session and learn a lot, all the stuff that they miss. So with that being said, I'm going to thank all of you, and I hope everyone enjoys this lovely day and the rest of this week. All right, well, take care. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.